Did you know that the country of Ethiopia is uh, mentioned in the Bible more than 40 times? So not many countries here can tell that of himself. And uh, our speaker, as you might know, is also from Ethiopia. His name, Tariku, means history maker. Not bad. <laughs> also at the campus, he studied uh, business and accounting, but he was just referred to as uh, his uh, major is Jesus and his minor is accounting. So I would like to ask him to come on stage now with your warm welcome, Tariku Fufa. Welcome. We agreed with Margarita to ask a question from no one, from every one of the speakers, the same question actually. And that would be, if you were to meet with God and ask him something, take a, uh, pose him a question, what would you ask of him? I would ask him, God, why did you love me so much like this? <laughs> Need I say more of him? Hear him speak. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I learned some four uh, greeting language, so, see ya. <laughs> Chest. <laughs> Privit. <laughs> Buna. <laughs> and then somebody said, private, Russia. <laughs> Okay, okay, yeah. Uh, I feel so honored and so privileged this morning to be here with you and to stand before you. So first of all, I would like to give glory to God and I'm so grateful to him. And then also, I would like to say thank you to my friend, Bill Babion. In Africa, people call him Bill Baboon. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so whichever way you call him he's a he's a great friend and i really love his heart for the lord and i appreciate his leadership and he leads from his heart and so bill thank you for having me here thank you uh Eastern europe slm leadership team for having me here uh this morning, I'm given a topic, who are you going to be? A call to become a disciple. And before I go there, let me show you. This is a picture of my beautiful wife. Uh, her name is Buze, and Buze means plenty. <laughs> so she is my plenty. <laughs> and um, we are married almost for the last eight years. We don't have children of our own, but for the last eight years we are still on honeymoon. So that's a long honeymoon. It's so sweet. <laughs> and uh, uh, last year in October, Buze's sister went to be with the Lord, and uh, so she left these two little kids behind, and uh, my wife and I, we are in the process of adopting them. And um, so pray for us. Their father, he's a responsible man. He doesn't live with them. He doesn't love them, but still try to block the adoption. But we love them. Deborah and Wako, she's two and he's six. We love them and we, say we put them in school now. So this is uh, my family. So I come from Africa. And uh, some of you, you may not know where Africa is found. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, Africa is a little bit li like when I crossed uh, African airspace, we entered into Albanian airspace. So I thought, okay, we are not very far from Eastern Europe. <laughs> and uh, this is the region where I lead, uh, 24 countries. And uh, there are three little tiny islands here where we don't have anything going on currently. This morning I was talking to Bill, would you please send your student? <laughs> to this one, the expedition team. <laughs> and so I am posing a challenge to Eastern Europe. Uh, and we have like these islands, they are very expensive for Africans. 
very expensive to go. It's very cheap to fly from Germany to, to here than to fly from South Africa here uh, for Africans. So for you, you are really most welcome here. And so, so I lead, uh, I, okay, I am from Ethiopia here, but I live here with my wife, Zimbabwe. This is where the area office is located. I give leadership to all these 24 countries in terms of SLM. So this is my beloved country, Ethiopia. And uh, so population is 84 million, thus in 2007, but now we are 93 million. And 80% uh, evangelical Christianity, 42% Orthodox Christianity, 34% Islam and, and, and others. So I was born somewhere around here on the corner. So I come from a rural area. I'm not a city boy. <laughs> and so having saying this, uh, just let me read for you this morning my favorite scripture, Acts chapter 20, verse 24. That's my favorite part of scripture. So <coughs> let me read it. But I do not count my life of any value, nor as precious to myself, if only I may finish my course and the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. Paul said, Paul said when he was with, uh, in Ephesus and then uh, while he was leaving, somebody came to him and said, Paul, please don't go to Jerusalem. Don't go to Jerusalem, because if you go to Jerusalem, you will be persecuted. And you will be imprisoned. Nothing good is there for you. Don't go. And then Paul said, he said to the elders and the people who came to him, he said, for the sake of finishing the race, and then also for the sake of testifying to the gospel of grace, he said, I count my life nothing. I count my life not dear for me. He said, I am ready to go. And so for me, when I think of discipleship, I think a true follower of Jesus Christ, a true disciple, should be able to say like Paul said. Paul said, my life is nothing to me. Actually, he said, when he was told he will be imprisoned, if you read further, he said, not only imprisonment, he said, I am even ready to die for the sake of the gospel of Jesus in Jerusalem. And Paul was like, for him, for the sake of the gospel of Jesus, Paul didn't care if they starve him, if they kill him, or if they torture him, he was ready. Last uh, two days ago, my friend David Rice and Susan Rice, I was with them here for one day, and so I was touring Budapest, and, and uh, so they, they, uh, they took me to, uh, um, David, what do you call that place? Terror yes, Terror Museum. And uh, we went there, and it was like a horrible place. <laughs> Just what happened? I was crying inside because com Ethiopia was also communist for 17 countries. When Ethiopia went through communist, they killed almost half a million people uh, during that time in Ethiopia as well. So where they imprison people, where they torture people, when I saw that, this verse came to me. Paul was ready even to go to such place for the sake of the gospel of Jesus. He said, Nothing can stop me. Amen? So for me, this is where the concept of discipleship comes from. When Jesus said, go and make disciples of all nations, the commitment should be like the one Paul had, where you reach the level where you say, I'm, if I'm getting starved for the sake of following Jesus, I'm ready. If I'm going to be chased away from my university for the sake of Jesus, I'm ready. If I am humiliated, if I am 
broken, if, if I'm burned alive, if they cut my neck off for the sake of the gospel of Jesus, I am ready. When you reach that stage, when you have that kind of commitment, for me, that is a true indicator in your life that you are truly following Jesus Christ. But if you are saying, okay, as long as freedom of religion is there, as long as everything is all right, as long as I have my support, as long as everything is good, I follow Jesus. But when the bad day comes, I can go and always find my way. That's a questionable lifestyle. So this is my favorite part of scripture. Let me tell you something about myself. 11 uh, 16 years ago, 16 years ago, when I was a second year university student, when I was a second year university student, I came out and one night I was just meditating on my life, how the Lord cared for me, how Jesus loved me. That night I was just reflecting how the Lord raised me from the street. I was thrown on the street when I was one year old. My mom threw me on the street and she left. I was there. I was asthmatic. I was asthmatic patient. I couldn't breathe. I was born with asthma. I was hated, rejected by people. And then when I gave my life to Jesus, at the age of 13, again, my fam, my parents, they again sent me on the street. For six years I lived on the street. I suffered. So there is no way for me to go to university. There is no way to me to, for, for me to be alive. So that night I was just meditating how good God is, how wonderful Jesus is. And then I said, I asked one question. I said, Lord, in response to all your goodness and kindness to me, what shall I give to you? That night I asked him when I was second year university student. And then the Lord said, Tariku, give your life to me. He said, you surrender all. You dedicate your life or you make a reserved commitment. The Lord said to me that night. And then I said, I knelt down and I said, I, I raised my hand up like this. And as I was kneeling down like this, I said, Lord, when I die, I am even ready to die martyr days. I say, Lord, I don't want to die on hospital bed. Lord, I don't want to die on my house bed. I want to commit everything to you. When I graduate, I will follow your purpose. I will serve you. I say, Lord, send me to anywhere in the world where other missionaries, they don't want to go. Send me to Iraq. Send me to Iran. I say, Lord, send me to anywhere. Let them cut my neck. I am ready to die. I made a reserved commitment that night. I tell you, since that day, since that night, my life has never remained the same. Praise the Lord. Amen. Just before even I talk more about discipleship, I want to challenge you today. My beloved Eastern European students and staff and missionaries from all over the world who are here. If persecution comes, if communist, communism come again, or if terrorists come to you, or some, somebody come with their sword, with their gun, and ask you this question, you die right now, or you denounce your faith? If you are given this option today, will you be able to say like Paul, my life is not dear to me, my life is nothing to me? May the Lord help us. Amen. Let's pray. Let's pray. Lord, your love is so great. You changed our lives. You've written our name in the book of life. And you are preparing a better place for us in heaven. Great glory is waiting for us in heaven. But while we are here on earth, you asked us first to follow you, first to be with you, and then go out and represent your kingdom. And you said while you are in the world, 
there will be a lot of tribulations. There will be a lot of inconvenience. But Lord, you promise that we will overcome this. I pray today in the name of Jesus. I speak about, as I speak about discipleship, becoming a true follower of Jesus. I pray for myself and for all the students here, for all the conference here, that you would create a reserved commitment in our lives. That we would say, I, there is nothing I can hold back. I am ready for the cause of Jesus. I am ready to follow him anytime, anywhere, wherever the Lord wants me to be. Lord, I pray that you will help us. You will right now strengthen our inner personality. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. <clears throat> what is discipleship? I don't want to share much, but just this is the best definition of discipleship I had. Discipleship is to help someone grow into Christ-likeness. The goal of discipleship is to grow into Christ-likeness. At the end of the day, we need to be like Christ. A disciple is a learner who follows his leader with the intent to pass on what he has learned as he puts into practice in his own life. So, simply discipleship is a long process. It's a lifetime process. Every day we get conformed into the likeness of his son. Desi discipleship involves commitment. We need to make commitment. There are two types of commitment. One is lukewarm commitment, where it's half-half, as long as everything is fine. When communism came to Ethiopia about 40 years ago, a lot of people went back. They denied Jesus because their commitment was they had lukewarm commitment. But another type of commitment is a reserved commitment, where you say 100%. No turning back for me. So, so discipleship involves commitment. It's, 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 it's also a relationship. Put first thing first. We are talking a lot about going, about making disciples. But the topic I have this morning is put the first thing first. We are first called to be disciples before we, are, we, make, we make disciples. We are first to be disciples. Are you a true follower of Jesus? Will you be able to stand up for Jesus? Say, I am not only a Christian, but I am a true follower of Jesus. There is a difference between being called Christian and being, being called disciple. And then we are first to live with before sent for Jesus. Are you living with Jesus? Are you enjoying him every day? Are you falling in love with Jesus? Is there anyone who ever fallen in love with somebody here is there anyone <laughs> for me yes about 10 years ago when i first saw my wife my today's wife when i saw her i felt strange feeling here <laughs> and as the day goes i fall in love with her so i wanted to be with her every day I wanted to call her. I wanted to hear from her. Because why? I was, i fallen in love. Same thing. Are you fall in love with Jesus? Are you fall in love with Jesus? Do you want to be with him every time, every moment? We are first followers before we are leaders. Are we truly following Jesus? Who we are is more important to God than what we do for him. Who are you? It, it is possible to become pastor. It's possible to preach on TV. It's possible to become missionaries. Yet, you are not truly following him. John Wesley, he went from England to America. John, John, John Wesley. For two years, while he was evangelizing the Red Indians in the U.S., for two years, he was not Christian. He was not even a disciple. And then it is the Moravians who went from this continent to America who led him to Christ and discipled him. It's possible. So simply, 
Being is greater than doing in God's business. Who you are is more important to God than what you do for him. Who is disciple? Who is disciple? Disciple is follower. Simply, disciple is follower. Disciple is a student. Student like you. Disciple is dedicated. Disciple is imitator. He tried to imitate. He tried to imitate his leader. Just let me give you this thing, what's happening in Africa. Africa is like, Africa is kind of, in terms of weather, it's, it's very hot most of the time. And so because of that, you have to wear a light clothes or whatever, even when you preach. But a lot of pastors in the church, even when the temperature is about 40 degrees Celsius or over 100 Fahrenheit, they wear their, you know, big coat and ties and all those things, and they carry big towels and whatever. You know whom they are imitating? They are imitating some preachers in the U.S. in the cold place. <laughs> and they are doing that, and I approach some pastors and ask them, and they don't know what they do because they, they are just following. So disciples, when we say imitator, we imitate Christ. Amen? We, and then, like young people in Africa, if you see them, is there anyone who knows Justin Bieber? <laughs> and most of them, maybe 99% of them, they have never seen him face to face. But everybody in his school, on campus, they talk about Justin Bieber. They dress like him, you know, they walk like him. <laughs> and they don't have hairstyle like him, but say, buy this artificial hair from China. <laughs> Why? They want to imitate him. You know, they are being discipled. So, disciple is imitator. Are we imitating Christ? Whom are we imitating today? Today, unfortunately, most of us, we imitate we try to be like media entertainers, isn't it? They are the one, and most of us, I, I know in Africa it's like that. And then disciple is loving, disciple is bearing fruit. If you are disciple, true follower of Jesus, you bear some sort of fruit for Christ. In the area of worship, it could be in the area of prayer, evangelism, whatever according to your gift. And then Disciple passes on what he has learned. So who is disciple? Just let me uh, give you one example. Uh, let me give you one testimony, Daniel's testimony. I was privileged in Ethiopia, as, as, as you've seen the video, in eight years. I, ha I was privileged to see people discipled and multiplied from six to 7,300 over the period of eight years. Just let me give you just one example. Uh, I started in, 2000 and, and, and in 2002, I started ministry with six students. Three of them sitting at the back here, and then three of them sitting here with six students. I just discipled them. How did I disciple? Discipleship is more caught than taught. It means like, Instead of lecturing like this, if you bring people and live with you and see your lifestyle, they see what discipleship is. And so, so for four months, I discipled them and released them. After four months, they all went out and had shared their faith, and they all had their, 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 their people. And then, so I brought them together. And one of them, guy, the guy here, whom I led to Christ, he went out and shared his faith, and uh, he led Daniel to Christ. Daniel took this picture the day he gave his life to Christ. Daniel was a drunkard. Daniel was like a village bully. Daniel was very arrogant. Even on campus, he's known 
He's very athletic. He's very, like he knows a lot of this karate, whatever. And so everybody afraid of him. <laughs> but this guy, he approached him. And he shared Christ with him. And the Spirit of God convicted Daniel. Daniel took this picture and he said he smiled for the first time in his life. That's what he told us. And then this guy discipled Daniel. And the, the Daniel's life completely changed. In one week, Daniel was completely like radically changed. And then after that, Daniel went out and led Tesfai the Muslim to Christ. Tesfai was Muslim. But he used to be Daniel's friend. And so Daniel went to Tesfai and he said, Tesfai, you got to follow Jesus. And then Tesfai, who is a Muslim, he said, no, I don't believe in Jesus. And then Daniel said, who are you not to believe in Jesus? <laughs> <laughs> I believed in Jesus. Who are you? <laughs> Somehow he was intimidated, <laughs> but he gave his life to Jesus. And then, and then Daniel, as you can see at night, now they became friends and so he discipled him. And God used Daniel's personality. To lead. And then after that they went out and then they established their group. And this is Tesfais and Daniel's group. And they multiplied and they were going for outreach. And then after that, after, after that, for three years, I didn't see Daniel because I, I was asked to move from where I was to Addis Ababa, the capital of Ethiopia. After, and, 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 and then Daniel, before I left there, Daniel went out to his village during school vacation. He shared his faith with his family. When the village people, his parents, whatever, saw the life change in Daniel, 17 people gave their life to Jesus. And then Daniel planted a little church for them. And then after that, I never heard, uh, heard from Daniel. And then after three years, I met Daniel in Addis Ababa when he came to do his master's degree. And I asked him about that little church of 17 people in his village. He told me that little church multiplied into 3,000 members. This is the power of discipleship. This is the power of discipleship. So... Why God used Daniel like that? Because Daniel became a true follower of Jesus. And why Daniel listened to this guy here? Tolesa, his name is Tolesa. Because Daniel admired the way Tolesa lived on campus. His life was like really so convincing. And so this is a power of discipleship. So who is disciple? Just I want to follow... Disciple is not above his master, Jesus said. So whatever Jesus went through, we also go through. Disciple of responsive heart. Who is disciple? Disciple practices what is taught. Disciple is a learner. Disciple learn from Jesus, from what disciple is obedient. I want to I want to just pause a little bit here. Obedience. In my walk with the Lord for the last 22 years and then also in my ministry involvement for the last 12 years something that God really appreciate in our life is obedience if I can advise you one thing I would say obey the Lord all the days of your life if you are obeying the Lord it doesn't matter whether you are weak or strong the Lord still can use you. Amen. In Africa, we say amen. <laughs> so obedience is very important. And in the Bible, you would, if, if, if you read your Bible, you will see God get angry with people who are not obeying him. God doesn't get angry with sinners. Look at David. David was murderer. He was adulterer. Isn't it? He doesn't qualify to become a leader in God's kingdom. But because of his heart, God, because of his obedience heart, God actually said, David is a man after my heart. God, what number one quality, this is my personal conclusion. 
that the Lord looks in his people is obedience. Do you obey him at even any risk? Obey. Look at Peter. Peter was impulsive. He get angry. He is emotional so many times. But he was obeying the Lord Jesus. He said, even Jesus, I'm willing to die. God used him. So obedience. And then obedience. And then disciple is a trainer. Disciple is ambassador. Disciple is good representative of his leader. So disciple is faithful. I also want to pause here. You know what? When we get to heaven, God will never say to us, Bill Baboon, <laughs> you are very successful. God doesn't say that. God doesn't say, David Rise, you are a great leader. You are very successful. You touch Brazil, you touch Africa, you touch Korea all over. God doesn't say that. But God says, Bill, David, he calls each one of you. He said, you faithful servant. Amen? God looks for faithfulness. Mother Teresa, she came from Eastern Europe to India. You know her, right? She's from this great continent. Here is what she said. She's one of my heroes. I read his, her biography. She said when she faced a lot of opposition in India and all over the world, at some point she felt like quitting. But then she said, God never called me to be successful, but to be faithful. So it's my encouragement to you that today, regardless of whatever challenge you have, be faithful. Don't aim at success, but at faithfulness. That's a mark of discipleship. Loyal, willing to pay price, self-denial. Just let me give you my personal testimony. Uh, I have got like 14 minutes. So in Africa, 14 minutes is just for greeting. <laughs> 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 so, <laughs> but I'm in Europe, so I have to adjust. Uh, and uh, <laughs> uh, <clears throat> I especially love this thing, willing to pay price and self-denial. I come from a broken family. My mom, okay, my dad had three wives, and we, I, we are 12. I have 12 half-brothers and sisters, and they all from the two mothers. I was the only one in the family. And so because of that, I was never beloved. My mom was divorced at a, when I was one year old. And then in the family, I was never beloved in the community. Everybody looked down on me. And then when I turned 13, I gave my life to Jesus at the age of 13. And that night, I was lying in bed because of the asthma. I couldn't breathe at that time. It was the asthma was eating me up, so I was really suffering. But because Jesus came into my life, I was rejoicing. And then my dad, he heard that I gave my life to Jesus, so he walked into the room where I was sleeping. He came with my stepmother, and then he asked me to get up, and then I couldn't. Then he grabbed my ear, my stepmom also grabbed my ear this side, and then they dragged me to living room. And when I went to the uh, and and then. They asked me, my half-brothers and sisters, they were all waiting there, and they asked me to denounce my religion. And then I said, no. My dad said, Tariq, I give you choice. Choose between your Jesus and your family. I said, I chose Jesus. He said, do you know what does it mean to choose Jesus? He said, you are going to die. I'm going to throw you on the street. You have no one to care for you. This asthma, you are, you, are, you are a sick person, so you are going to die of the asthma. And then I said, Dad, even if it means days, I still choose Jesus. When I said that, my dad got angry, he beat me, and then my stepmom, she beat me, my half-brothers and the sisters, they all cheered him on, saying, kill Tariku, kill him, kill him. And then my dad, he bite me and he cut my face and shed my blood and he used some scissors, some metal and cut my face. There are some scars. And then that night he threw me on the street. For six years from that day, most of the years I lived on the street, on the street of Ethiopia. And my dad was a businessman. I could eat 
But when I was thrown on the street, I became starved. I became so hungry because there is nothing to eat on the street. I didn't have any business. I didn't have any family who can help me. And there was three days in a, day, in a row or sometimes five days without eating. I thought I was going to die. But every day, every single day on the street, I would pray. Every single day, I think of Jesus. On the street, every single day, I say, Lord Jesus, one day I will come to heaven. I will live with you in heaven. So that really encouraged me. And then, as I was there on the street, I had three friends, and all of them died one by one. One from cholera, one from malaria, all. And so one day, I thought I was going to die. So when I was going to die, when I thought that I came out, stood in the overhead sun and then pointed my finger to heaven like this, I cried. I said, Lord, I'm going to die today. I, f I smelled it that night. So I said, Lord, I don't have anyone in my life. I'm going to die. Please, Lord, help me. So as I was praying, I heard silent and quiet voice of the Lord coming to me and saying, Tariku, my son, don't cry. You are not without help. It was a quiet voice. And then the Lord said, Tariku, I will take you from this street. I will send you to school. You go to university. You finish your degree. And then you put down your degree and move on. All over the world, you will go and preach my gospel in the language that you have never spoken. The Lord said that. I was just, I couldn't believe. And then uh, the Lord said, the Lord also said, I'm going to heal you from the asthma. So just right after that, in three months' time, when I turned 16 years old, the Lord healed me from the asthma miraculously. I was healed in the church, uh, and, and so the Lord touched my heart, my, my heart and my lung, and so I was healed. And then after that, I went to school. Just to cut the long story short, uh, because of time is running, <laughs> to cut the long story short, after six years of suffering like that, my dad one day came. After six years, he came to the town where I was. He was at high school, at high school where I was going. And uh, he saw me there, and then he said, Tariku, is this a real Tariku, or is this a ghost? And then I said, Dad, this is your son, Tariku. He said, how about that asthma? How did you manage to live all these six years? And then I told him, Dad, you remember that night? Look at the scar on my face. You cut my face. You saw me on the street. You rejected me. My mom also rejected me when I was one year old. All of you rejected me, but Jesus, he accepted me. Jesus became my mom. Jesus became my dad. Jesus became my sister, my brother. Jesus became everything I needed in life. I told him, when I, when I told that, my dad cried. And then he asked me for forgiveness, which is unusual in African culture. And then he hugged me, and so after six years, he invited me to go back home. And then when I went back home, all my half-brothers and the sisters, they thought I was died. I, uh, I was dead a lo long time ago. And uh, when I left their home, I was, uh, I was like this, and uh, because I was a little bit doing good, but then on the street, I was like this and even less. And so, but when they saw me, they, that day, when they saw me, I was actually growing. I didn't die. All my half-brothers and sisters, 12 of them, they gave their life to Jesus. All of them. And then when they gave their life to Jesus, my name was announced on radio. Because I come from a very rural area, so my name was come on radio. And then on that radio, they say, Tariku Fufa, you are qualified to join university. Congratulations. <laughs> And when my hometown people, village, when they heard about 400 of my aunties, uncles, those extended family, they became so proud. And then they came to congratulate me. And then when they came, I said, wait. They said, why? I said, you remember six years ago when I was on the street, when I was starving, you all rejected me, abandoned me. But today you think Tariku is making you proud. I said, it's not Tariku, it is my Jesus. I diverted their attention from me to Jesus. 
That day I preached them, all of them gave their life to Christ. And then our church, from one church, in six months, multiplied. Yeah. <laughs> Glory to Jesus. Amen. Praise God. And then our church, in Africa, a big church has like 50 members or 40 members. And it's not beautiful like this. So that little church multiplied into 23 little, little churches because of my story. In my hometown, it's called Beggy. You can Google and see Beggy. People said Jesus was named after my name, so people said Jesus of Tariku. <laughs> Everybody, when they pray, they pray to Jesus of Tariku. They say, you are so good. You are so kind, Jesus. And then after that, I joined the university. As the Lord said on the street, I studied accounting for four years. But when I was in university, 80% of my time in university would go to evangelism, discipleship, leadership. The first day as a freshman, the first day I set my foot on university, I said, I am a student leader. Without even meeting Campus Crusade people, I said, I'm here. And then I looked for leaders. They didn't look for me. I looked for them. And then I said, I'm not a freshman. And then they say, you are a freshman. I say, no, 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 no. I come by purpose. And then the first day I was appointed, they said, okay, we will make you a prayer leader. So the first day I became a prayer leader, I was actually welcoming freshman student <laughs> after arriving. So on university, 80% of my time would go to evangelism simply because of the, in my academics, I was among the top in the accounting. Because of that, I was also imprisoned, went to jail several times. Muslims took me to jail several times. Because of that, I was popular in the university, so they gave me a nickname. They said, for Tariku, Jesus major, business minor. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so when I was about to graduate and uh, finish, I was approached by Ethiopian Airlines, which is a Star Alliance member. They are partner with Lufthansa, like a big airline in Africa. They said, Tariku, come and work for us before even I graduate. They said, we will pay you $500 a month. In Ethiopia, government would pay only $50 a month for accountants. But they say $500. We will send you to Europe. We will send you to America. Like, as African student, you don't even think twice. You say, yes. But then I prayed. The Lord said, Tariku, I also need you. Right. Remember on the street. Campus Crusade people came and they said, work with us. I said, how much do you pay? <laughs> <laughs> and then I said, and then they said, zero salary. <laughs> so that night, I again said, Lord, I surrender all. Again, I surrender all. I said, Lord, where, where, if I eat or not, if I die or live or, or not, I now join the staff. My future is in your hand. I surrendered everything. I joined the staff. So after that, I went to you all over. And so this is what I want to share with you, my beloved European friends, students, staff. God can, God alone is enough. God alone is enough for you. If you have Jesus, if you fall in love with him, you want to talk to him every time you meet or in the bus, on iPhone, talk to Jesus. <laughs> Through Facebook, talk to him. You know, whatever you can, using, if you talk to him, fall in love, Jesus alone is enough. One person with God is the majority. Because you are alone, you are not a minority. You are the majority. And then God, he can call the unqualified and then make them qualified. I never spoke English. I never thought I would be in, in Europe here and speak to European students like this. And uh, Bill put me in a very nice room and I've never thought I slept under mango tree. I slept on the street. Now I'm here, I never thought. Just, I know in heaven the best is yet to come. So I want to encourage you, love Jesus, walk with him. Here is what helped me, prayer and fasting. 
I'll be doing a seminar on fasting, word of God, fellowship with believers, sharing my faith, obedience to the teachings of Christ. These are my five building blocks of discipleship. You can have a lot, but for me, these are the ones. And then three areas, discipleship, for me, every time I follow Jesus, impartation of knowledge, developing of skills, and then building of characters. Discipleship, a true follower of Christ needs to grow in this area. Three areas where changes should be seen. Spiritual life, thought life or mindset, change of actions. So this is it, and thank you so much. I am left for with 40, 44 seconds. Wow, I've done great. <laughs> thank you.